Well, welcome back everybody. And this is the last session that we'll be sharing together. Although this is a pre-recorded session, this will be the last uh, tutorial that uh, we'll be doing for organizational behavior as next week will be our final. And uh, again, let me begin by saying it has been an honor and a pleasure to be with you in this course and to have walked with you through all the different chapters and uh, through all the assignments and the midterm and uh, I just want to wish you all the best as we move forward past this lecture into the final exam. Also want to remind you that there'll be office hours next week, one hour prior to the final exam through Zoom. I'll send you that link ASAP, probably within the middle of this week, near the end of the week, and uh, we'll be there for one hour, not uh, obligated to show up. If there's no attendance uh, that will be taken, you're not required to be there. It's just uh, uh, an opportunity that I'm offering to you to touch base with me just before the exam starts. So um, again, so there'll be a one hour uh pre-exam open office hour available for you and then the exam itself will be available for download at 545 and then you'll have three hours to write the exam and put it into the assignment folder in the shell in the hub so without further ado let us uh, get started here with organizational change one of my favorite chapters I know I've said that a lot but one of my favorite chapters in this whole section and so uh, we want to start off first with the idea of the force field anal analysis model and um, this is this is Lewin's analysis model and what he really was driving at was this idea that there's restraining forces and driving forces when we're talking about change in organizations and driving forces are those are those things that push us towards change. They're usually external uh, things that happen in the environment or in the market. Uh, they can also be from the leader themselves and, and interpreting the times and looking at what's going on in the market and understanding that maybe a change is needed within the organization. And so those two things are the most common things that would drive an organization towards change. Some of the restraining forces, and one of the biggest ones, quite frankly, is this idea of resistance to change. And so we, we have this idea now that um, with restraining forces, we are looking at people's resistance to change. So this idea of resistance to change is pretty significant. Um, and as we'll be talking a bit more of that as we get into today's lecture. But uh, there's also behaviors that block the change process. And there's also people who just try to maintain the status quo. And they don't like change. For, for the most part, people do not like change. And so when we're looking at organizational change within a particular time frame for an organization, um, resistance to change can be broken down into a, a couple different subsets. Um, but uh, but when we look at the, the largest restraining force against change, it's usually that people don't like change to begin with. And so when we continue to look at the force field analysis model, you'll see here that it, at, at, at the point of prior to change, the restraining forces and the driving forces are somewhat mitigated by each other. There's equal force on both sides. There may be some fluctuation up and down uh, regarding little changes here and there. But any significant change that happens will require the organization to provide an, an imbalance on one side of the equation, more often the driving force. So like I said earlier, the external or the leader themselves can be putting a ton of effort behind the driving force. And so the driving force actually has to become greater than the restraining force for the organization to see any movement, to see any momentum. And then over time, when that change has been concluded, you'll see that the driving force and the restraining force are back together again in this harmonious relationship. Uh, again, a little push and pull on both sides, not a lot of uh, significant movement or momentum but in essence, they're the same thing. So in essence, what we see here is this movement from this point up to here, okay? And some people like myself would call that growth, organizational growth or professional growth or, or personal growth, uh, but that growth or that change has been initiated by, the, in large degree, what's happening 
on the driving side of change. So when we try to understand resistance to change, there's many forms of resistance. People will complain, people will have this idea of non-compliance, and they're not going to be total jerks about it, but they're going to be passive, okay? They're not going to go out of their way to sabotage or to derail change uh, situations, although that could be true in, in some circumstances. Uh, but more often than not, People will vote with their feet, and that's what we mean or what I mean sometimes by this idea of absenteeism is they will voice their opinion by not showing up. They will voice their opinion by not engaging in any of the processes. Uh, so subtle resistance is more common than overt uh, resistance. Now, subtle resistance um, can be hard to change and hard to deal with, uh, but it is also easier to deal with than the overt resistance to change, okay? Because um, it's you're really dealing with a, with a, a very negative power when it comes to overt resistance to change. So reviewing z uh, resistance as task conflict, when we see this idea that, that or this inaction of people resisting change, um, some people view resistance uh, as a lack of readiness for change. And so in some change models, like John Cotter's change model, for instance, he talks about urgency. And in this need for urgency, it will, it will either be intrinsic, it will either be there already, or it will be the leader or the leader's responsibility to try and create urgency. And then we're not talking about creating urgency out of nothing and, and just moving change into place for the sake of change. That's never healthy. But what John Cotter is talking about is the, it may become the leader's responsibility to begin informing the constituents of the need for change. Because the leader's vision anticipates an organizational change is needed and, and perhaps there's not a lot of people in the organization who share the same perspective or the same, same feelings about change. And so it now becomes the leader's job to create that urgency. Some view resistance as a form of voice, right? And so what we mean by that is this resistance uh, comes in the form of conversation. And so people want to engage in constructive criticism and constructive conversation as a form of resistance. And this is a healthy way in engaging resistance because, for one, it communicates to people that you're willing to listen, that you're not just going to steamroll them with this change effort that's going to take place. And so you actually generate feelings of fairness in the group. And, and in doing so, it has this real large benefit of creating an environment that demonstrates a commitment to listen and a commitment to change. And so when, when leaders come in, especially and say, listen, we need, we need to uh, investigate a specific change. We need to take a look at doing something differently in, in, in our organization, understanding that people don't like change. One of the best ways to overcome that resistance is to include them in conversations. And it, 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 it slows the process down for sure, but it's a needed slowing down. Because in that slowing down, you're not only giving people time to process and to think, but you're giving people opportunity to speak into the change. And if you've, if you've listened to me enough throughout this course, you'll understand from my perspective that when we bring more people into the conversation, you bring more opportunities for a better change process to happen because maybe they see things slightly differently than you and maybe they can fill in some of the blind spots that you might be suffering from. And so why people resist change? One, well, they tend to think negatively more than positively. And so they may be afraid of some of the outcomes. So people will, will tend to assume the worst. Um, People may feel that they have a lack of control in the change. And the third one is interesting in the sense that um, it's called this not invented here syndrome. And in essence, they're saying, well, if it didn't come from us, if the idea for change didn't originate with us, then it, it's probably not a good idea. That's not necessarily true, although that could be true in some degrees, not necessarily true. But more often than not, one of the biggest resistance to change, why people 
um, don't like to change is because of fear and fear of the unknown. People like to be comfortable, and there's nothing wrong with that. People like consistency. They need consistency. Uh, very few people actually flourish in an environment that's very fluid and very agile. Okay, um, people like to show up. They know what they, they they like the fact that they know what they're going to do for a particular day or for a particular week or a particular project, and they don't necessarily like to thing see things change. And and we have to understand that. Some other reasons why people may resist change is it breaks up their routine. Again, it causes some kind of discomfort for them when they're working. Right? It changes their routines and sometimes their habits. And and they've been they've been doing things a certain way for so long that they may not even be thinking about the process as much as they are doing the process. And so when this change comes into effect, you're threatening that that comfort level. You're threatening that that state that they're in that they may have worked really hard to get into and they may not want to repeat that same amount of work to get to a new habit. Um, people may resist change because they may feel that the change is incongruent, okay? And so teams, um, the way they behave will conflict with the desired change that you want. So that, that'll, be, that'll be a resistance to change as well. The incongruent to organizational systems means that people will pull back to doing what they have always done when they run into too much resistance or too much um, uh, frustration, too much confusion, not enough clarity. They'll just revert back to the way that they've always done things. Okay, And so there's this idea of trying to create an urgency for change. And how do we do that? Well, we inform employees about the driving forces. We're honest with them about why we think the change needs to happen. And so you'll see organizations do environmental scans. They'll, you'll see them do market an, uh, analysis. You may even see them do surveys or, or anything of that nature to find out what the, the external environment is doing. Because remember, organizations for the most part are open systems. And so they are susceptible to changes in their marketplace. And so when they do these things and they, and they find that, yes, we, the organization needs to make a shift, sometimes it's really hard for the organization to make a shift if they're doing well, right? Uh, if they're making money, if they're growing, if they're taking over more of the market, um, it may be hard to prove to the organization that they need to change because things are working well. So some ways to look at change or to create this urgency of change is from a customer perspective. And so they would call this customer driven change. And so they receive feedback from their clients. They receive input from their customers as to what could be better. So what you're doing is really good, but it could be better. And these are some things that you should consider in implementing into the process to make this product better. So that's customer driven change. So creating an urgency to change without the external drivers requires a lot of persuasive influence. And this is where we come into leadership styles now when it, when it pertains to organizational change. And so some of the more um, productive and, and effective leadership styles for this, in, this environment would be um, situational leadership transformational leadership, even servant leadership, because what you're doing is you're building relationships with people. And in those relationships, you're trying to use uh, influence and persuasive arguments to create a shift in people's thinking. Okay. Um, and, and transformational leadership works really well with this because transformational leadership tends to focus a lot on the positive aspects of what's going on rather than the negative. And, and they tend to focus in on, on strengths rather than weaknesses. And that's really important because if people are already feeling threatened by change, they want to be, they want to feel secure as much as they can as they begin to move into a change. Okay. And so the idea of focusing in on the positive rather than the negative becomes a really important idea when it when we talk about or experience organizational change. So some ideas to think about 
when we're when we're trying to reduce these restraining forces okay because the whole idea again back to Lewin's model is that when we when we want to create change we have to we have to have a stronger force on the driving side rather than on the resistance side okay so how do we res how do we reduce those restraining forces number one communication again it's not a it's not a surprise to us it's just come up time and time again but communication is the number one thing that we need to employ when we're talking about some kind of organizational change. So it should be our highest priority, it should be the first strategy that you introduce uh, because it reduces uncertainty. It reduces the am ambiguity. Uh, seeking clarity is always the best idea. It's not just always a good idea, it's always the best idea. And when you're not clear, when you're a little foggy about what you should say and how you should say it and why you're going to say it, then it's going to be like a fog bank to those who are listening to you. So you first have to really get uh, the clarity under your belt. You really have to become clear yourself before you start communicating the change or the need for change to others. Learning now becomes uh, an active uh, way in reducing or minimizing restraining forces. So workshops, um, lunch and learns, uh, some instructional videos, bringing experts in to talk about uh, the changing marketplace or a new product. And, and providing these opportunities for your employees to learn not only builds into them the idea that learning is important for your organization, it actually helps them to engage in the process because now they're thinking about this change initiative from different perspectives and they're getting more information. And whenever we can provide more information to our people, that's always a good thing. Uh, and it, we have to understand too that we can never have all the information that we need to make a decision, but we're striving to about 70 or 80% of that information that's needed to make a good decision. Okay, so communication and learning are the, are the top two. Number three, employee involvement. Get them engaged. And, and one of the biggest things about getting employees engaged is being engaged yourself. You can't expect others to engage if you're not engaging yourself. So getting employees involvement means giving them more responsibility, giving them a feeling of more ownership in the process. This reduces fear. Because you're sharing information, you're in a sense when you're sharing information and you're communicating, you're sharing power, okay? And and people will feel more secure. People will feel more um, ready to move into change if they feel that they have a shared and a vested interest in this, okay? Stress management is another way to do it. So um, getting rid of the fear of the unknown, uh, looking at more efficient ways to create not only the change, but also to sustain the change, including people in problem solving. Uh, that in, in and of itself is a massive investment in helping people to feel more comfortable with the change process. Negotiation, having people uh, engage in a process of negotiating for uh, new positions or negotiating their way through different problems, okay? Coercion, never really a good way to get organizational change movement, but it can work in small circumstances. What it really, what it really means is you're beginning to um, become very assertive in how you exert your influence. Okay, um, Some of the problems with coercion is it develops less trust, okay? and it increases the politics. So these things can, can, can actually help the restraining force become stronger if it's not done right. So I never, well, I shouldn't say never, I hardly ever use coercion of any kind when it comes to organizational change. And that means that, that the process for organizational change is going to take longer. So if I, if I steer away from things like negotiation and coercion, it's going to take longer to, to see that change initiated, but that's always better than the alternative. So 
speaking about transformational leadership and change, transformational leaders are change agents. And in fact, they're, they're, the transformational leadership style is one of the best styles to use in, in any kind of change model, okay? Because not only have, have they usually wrestled through the vision of what it's going to take to get the change started and initiated and sustained, they can usually see the end result. And when they see the end result, they begin to, what I like to say, they begin to act consistently with the vision. And so there's that congruence, right? So if we have the vision over here that this is where we need to be and this is where we are right now, then transformational leadership knows those steps that have to occur for the organization to land on that new spot. And because the transformational leader and the visionary leader have thought their way through the process, they know the steps that they need to take. And as they themselves take those steps towards that new vision, they demonstrate a congruency to the organization and, and builds trust. So strategic visions and change, they provide a sense of direction. They identify critical success factors. They link employees' values, right, which is massive because whenever we're talking about change, we're always talking about people evaluating their, their value systems. We're always asking people to evaluate whether this change initiative is worth it for them or not to be involved in, okay? And so you're always driving into what's valuable about this for them, not just for the organization, not just for you as the leader, but what's valuable for them in and through this change. So in one way is that we, we can, we can in, inform our people and get them more involved in organizational change is to embark on what we call action research. So action research is really action biased. It's action oriented combining with a research approach, okay? So the action piece is all about achieving a specific goal, right? And the research really brings in the reasons for going in that direction, but the action research model also includes our people in that process, in that bias of forward momentum, right? So some action research principles that we can apply. It has that open systems perspective. You've heard me talk about that a number of times in the course. And even in this lecture, I've already mentioned that because organizations are primarily open systems themselves, it makes sense to have action research principles that take into account the fact that our organization is an open system. We also have to understand that action research is a highly participative process, okay? This is not done in a vacuum. It's not done by the leadership committee. It's not done by the board. It's done by a broad spectrum of people within the organization. Now, depending on the size of the organization, that participative process could look very different from an organization that, that have, you know, a couple thousand employees in it. That process may take months, if not half a year to, to initiate so that it includes enough people. If your organization has, you know, 50 or less people, well, that process can, can take a day, maybe two at the most, right? Depending on how many teams you have and how detailed you want to go. One of the biggest things about action research uh, principles is that it's data driven. Okay, um, we make decisions based on the data that we glean through the process. Okay, and in the process, we're focused on problems. We're not focused on people. We're not focused on what could be or what should be. We're actually focused in on the problem itself. Okay, so it becomes somewhat subjective. Okay, and that's a good thing for for the process because you don't want people to begin thinking that it's about them or it's about it's against them. Okay, so some action research processes that we need to we need to think about. Well, we, we form a client consultant relationship, and that that may seem like a little formal to it, but really what you're doing is you're is you're is you're developing this relationship with people, and then we diagnose the need for change, and this is where we talk about that idea of urgency. Is is there an urgency for change? Is the urgency already there, or do we have to? create it. And then we introduce the intervention. So those are some solutions based on the data, right? So the diagnosis could not 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 just be, you know, a, a 
an urgency for change, but it's also going to include the process for change, whether they're surveys or, or world cafes or, or, or interviews or, or the like. We, so we, we introduce some interventions based on our, our findings. Then we evaluate whether or not those interventions have worked or not. Okay. And then we, then we, you know, we disengage our service or we disengage from the relationship. So it almost seems like it's like that, that uh, five stage model of team development, right? So right at the beginning, there's the idea of forming, right? And storming where we, we create the relationships and we, we start integrating our, our value process and we start to behave in a certain way in the norming stage. And then we go all the way through to performing and then adjourning. And that adjourning stage is when the team disbands, right? So this, this disengagement of the consultant services is something somewhat similar to that storming um, to uh, our storming, norming, forming, um, performing and adjourning, right? There's another way to, to approach um, organizational change and that's through appreciative inquiry. And so appreciative inquiry uh, has this idea in it. So if I boiled all these five steps down, appreciative inquiry has this idea that we're looking at what we need to do through the lens of what is working now and what has worked in the past. So that's why we call it appreciative, which means that we look at the we look at the positive that's going on right now. We focus on what's working well, not not what isn't working well. Okay, and so for instance, if you're looking at product development and you're looking at making a product better, an appreciative inquiry approach to that would be: so what's good about this product? What what is it about this product that's making it one of our best sellers or making it one of our top? pieces of our of our organization and what can we do to make it even better that's the positive principle behind it constructionist principle is is that our conversations we believe the conversations that we're having in our research and in our in our process is actually helping to shape the final outcome okay and and it has a bias towards action we're not just having these conversations for theory's sake we're looking at having these conversations in a very practical manner because we want them to have a practical outcome, okay? And so there's the five steps of appreciative inquiry there. And um, it, it's interesting when we start looking at the po- poetic principle and the anticipatory principle where, you know, w- people tend to be motivated by desirable visions. But that means you have to communicate that vision. That means that you have to constantly communicate that vision because some people are going to resist it. Some people are going to want to be shown why they should be involved in it. That's the value piece, right? Um, And so uh, when we look at appreciative inquiry approach, it becomes very significant for us to understand that it's not only positive outlook and, and a positive perspective on what's working now, what's worked in the past, but it has a positive look at the future as well, okay? One of the other models that we use is the 4D model, and we call it the 4D model of appreciative inquiry. So there's the discovery phase, there's a dreaming phase, there's a designing phase, and there's a delivering phase, okay? So that discovery phase is almost like the research part of it, discovering the best of what is about our product. So what what is the best thing about this this product that we do? And then there's the idea of, well, what could it be if we made it better? What would it look like? And and then there's the designing piece, right? And so we, we take those conversations that we've had and we begin applying them into the change. Okay. And so this this may be the stage where we find multiple iterations going on. Okay where we, we implement some change and then it happens. And then we, we may make a small adjustment and we, and we put it back out into the market, okay? Um, so there's lots of iteration that can go on here. And then developing objectives about what will be, right? And so when we have this new product, uh, we wanna be able to understand, so what will happen when this new product gets out in the market? What, how is it going to change? the marketplace? How is it going to change consumer behavior? How is it going to change the employee's behavior? Even how might it change your organization? And so we're, we're thinking about those things when it comes to the 4D model of appreciative inquiry. So large group interventions, um, world cafes and the like, uh, or large surveys, um, town hall meetings uh, are, are held in these large group interventions. Um, and we, we really tend to focus in on the whole system approach to it, 
right? Um, they're always future oriented. You usually create a shared vision, and that's really important when we talk about uh, organizational change because we want the vision of where we need to go to be shared by the people. So some limitations of these large group interventions, well, limited opportunity to contribute. You can't do large group interventions all the time because they're, they're, they're cost prohibitive for the most part, okay? Um, there is a risk that a few people will dominate the conversation because in large groups, you're not going to have the opportunity for everybody to speak. So usually those people who are the most comfortable in speaking or those people who feel they have the most to say could run the risk of dominating the conversation. And interestingly enough, large group interventions sometimes generate a high expectation about the future. And so uh, it, it may become problematic that people will begin thinking too far down the road and begin um, idealizing the whole process. Uh, they may be getting too far ahead of themselves and may skip uh, doing certain things that they need to do in order to achieve the goal. Or they may minimize certain things. Okay, So those are some limitations of large group interventions. Finally, I want to leave with you the idea that organizations are about people. And this is kind of what we started with the whole course, right? So way back in week one, when we talked about organizational behavior and the study of organizational behavior, I suggested to you the idea that the study of organizational behavior is really the study of people, okay? Because organizations in and of themselves, they're not a building, they're not a website, uh, they are about people. And when we talk about organizational behavior, we're really talking about the behavior of people. And so Andrew Carnegie uh, has this, this quote, and it's, it's a really significant quote because what he says here is that if you take away my people but leave my buildings, well, then, you know, the grass is going to grow and, and, you know, the buildings will stay there, but nothing's going to happen. But if you take away my buildings but leave me my people, soon we'll have a new and better building, right? And we see that all the time. And so, when we look at organizational change, you can't, you can't escape the need to look at organizational behavior and address it and coach people through it to get a better organization. And sometimes that means you hire different people. Sometimes that means you may have to let people go. But when we look at organizational change, it's about the changing of people's perspectives and sometimes the changing of people's behavior. That's why it's important to incorporate them in the process because inevitably when we, when we include them in the process for change, some parts of them will change too. So that concludes today's lecture and uh, I hope that uh, this covers enough for you. Uh, please be sure to familiarize yourself with all of the diagrams in the chapter uh, because the diagrams themselves are, su are subject to be on the final exam. And uh, remember, when you're, when you're looking at, at the diagrams, you want to ask yourself three questions. What's the name of the diagram? What's the concept that the diagram is trying to communicate? And how would I apply this in my context? How would I apply this where I work? How would I apply this even in my home or in my relationships? How would I apply this to the sports club that I'm coaching in or that I'm a part of or another club or another organization? It doesn't always have to be with work. These principles are transferable across many different spectrums. Okay, And so as you begin thinking through those three questions, you're really going to begin helping yourself to become more prepared for the final exam. Okay, So again, thanks again for... Uh, taking this course, obviously, but I just want to say a, a big thank you to you. And uh, I'm, I'm proud of you for, for what you've been able to accomplish in these last 12, 13 weeks. You've come a long way. You've learned a lot. Um, and more importantly, I, I hope that you've learned a few things that you will take with you into the next step of your journey, whether that's after graduation or into your next round of courses in the fall. So again, I want to wish you all the best. Take care. And if you need anything, you need to know how to get a hold of me through email. Be more than happy to answer any of your questions or concerns. Okay. Take care.